Camacha. Dr. Munder is a consultant rheumatologist from uh, St. Thomas's Hospital, and his main interest is in lupus, antiphospholipid syndrome, and catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Dr. Munder has uh, received many international prizes, including the ULAR and ELAR prizes, and he has a lot of researches and publications in this topic. He will talk uh, two lectures in this uh, session. The first one is antiphospholipid syndrome and catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. And the next lecture will be about antiphospholipid syndrome and pregnancy. Please, Dr. So Mondes, you are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Basil, for the invitation to come back to my home. I am Palestinian, so this is my home as well. So it's, it's always a pleasure to come back to Jordan. I have the challenge to, to present in half an hour updates about antiphospholipid syndrome, and I try my best to do it quickly and, 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 and tell you what we gained over the last uh, 35 years. We, we are celebrating now 35 years since the discovery of this syndrome when Graham Hughes and his team, at, uh, at, originally at Hammersmith Hospital in London, then in, 2000, in 1986, they moved to St. Thomas's Hospital, described this syndrome. So what we gained, first of all, we have the antibodies described since then and still stand. This is the first description of anti-cardiolipin antibodies in 26th of November 1983, which is exactly now 35 years. This is why we, this year we are celebrating the 35th anniversary of this syndrome. That doesn't mean the syndrome wasn't there. We knew about the lupus anticoagulant, but we have now a simple test, which is anti an antibody test, which I'm sure you have in Jordan, you have everywhere, which is available, and that facilitated the diagnosis of these uh, uh, patients with this syndrome. It's not rare syndrome, it affects, uh, there is estimation, obviously there is no very good epidemiological studies on this, it affects about 0.5% of the American population, is based on estimation, no epidemiological studies. So what's the syndrome, what we're talking about? We're talking about a syndrome, young, affect mainly young people, it affects children as well, it affects adults, elderly population, but the majority of patients are young people with venous and arterial thrombosis, which is unique about this syndrome, which make this syndrome different of congenital thrombophilia, which you have usually venous thrombosis. In this syndrome, you have venous and arterial thrombosis, i.e. the patient might have deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and a few years later have stroke from or heart attack at young age. And this is unique in this syndrome. Second, and most importantly, late pregnancy loss. Early miscarriage is very common, but late pregnancy loss, which is the topic of my second lecture, is very, very prominent and it's very important to diagnose because in the next pregnancy, treatment is very, very effective. Aspirin and heparin give success rate about 90%. Thrombocytopenia is a very good marker of this syndrome. If you are in doubt and you see the patient with levido reticularis like this and thrombocytopenia, suspect the syndrome. We consider very, very seriously adding thrombocytopenia in the criteria, and I'll show you later. But thrombocytopenia is common in autoimmune rheumatic diseases, and lupus, for example, is, is common, and not necessarily due to antiphospholipid syndrome, although it's frequently is due to antiphospholipid syndrome. Levido reticularis is a prominent feature in this disease. It's not pathognomonic, but it's really frequent. When you see it and, and you suspect the patient has antiphospholipid syndrome, it's a very useful marker. Many, many other manifestations are part of this syndrome, many of them. And we still in doubt whether we should include them in the classification criteria or not. And I will show you in a few minutes, we are assessing that this minute. While we are talking, the new criteria is being cooked and very likely some of these transverse myelitis or leg ulcers or, or especially uh, 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 <clears throat> the kidney, you know, thrombotic microangiopathy, very likely to be part of the new criteria. We're considering as well uh, cardiac manifestations as part of the criteria. We'll come to that in a minute, but you know, these criteria has been not touched since the original criteria in 1999. The original criteria established in 1999. In 2006, we changed the criteria, but I mark this in red, what we change only laboratory criteria. The clinical criteria, venous and arterial thrombosis, miscarriages we haven't touched since the original description of this syndrome 35 years back. I think it's the time 
it's good time to move on and change these criteria. And the new potential manifestations that should be added in the new criteria is we considering libido, the heart valve disease is very infrequent. I would say that that frequent, but when they are present in a patient, young patient without lupus, for example, should guide you to the antiphospholipid syndrome. These multiple infarcts, mort infarct in the brain, frequently found in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome. What we do about them? The kidney, thrombotic microangiopathy, should be part of the criteria. As I told you, we meet every couple of years as expert, and we are currently assessing which criteria should be part of the clinical manifestations that we're going to change in the future. And just, I don't have much time to go deep into this, but I summarize to you what the recommendation by the experts that we meet regularly is that future criteria should have at least APS nephropathy and heart valve disease. These should be part of the future new criteria <clears throat> added obviously to thrombosis and miscarriages. These other criteria like uh, uh, levido reticularis, thrombocytopenia, chorea, and all of that potentially, potentially should be added as part of the criteria. And the committee was against using seizures and migraine in future criteria. We'll see these criteria is being cooked, as I told you. And by the end of maybe in the middle or the end of next year, we will have the new criteria. Let me take you to another myth that we have in rheumatology. It's an absolute myth that you cannot diagnose patient with antiphospholipid syndrome unless you have persistently positive, moderate, high titer of antiphospholipid antibodies. This is rubbish. So what do you do with those patients that you see every clinic yourself tomorrow with deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, six miscarriages, and she had persistently positive IgG anticardiolipin antibody, persistently positive. You don't label her as antiphospholipid syndrome? You should label her antiphospholipid syndrome because something that you keep forgetting, and many serious colleagues still feel, feel and, and I feel that confusing even, that we don't have diagnostic criteria in rheumatology, in general speaking. The only disease that you would diagnose really in rheumatology is gout. You take liquid from there, you see the crystals, you have gout. You can cure that and treat that. The other diseases, you classify them. You don't diagnose them. You separate lupus from uh, myositis, from scleroderma, because of the different manifestations. All of them have antinuclear antibody positive. Many of them have raw antibodies. Not every raw antibody have Sjogren's syndrome. We could be, have lupus. And this is the th thing that we should always have in mind. Antiphospholipid syndrome is not different. We don't have diagnostic criteria for antiphospholipid syndrome. What we have is classification criteria. If they don't fulfill the classification criteria, call it possible antiphospholipid syndrome, probable antiphospholipid syndrome, but please treat, don't ignore. If you use the criteria for lupus, the classification of lupus, to diagnose lupus patients, you miss one third of the patients. The criteria tells you clearly, you need four criteria over time. You could have two criteria today. So what, till the patient go home, until you have four criteria, come back to my clinic, I label you lupus. Is that correct? No. You diagnose patient as possible lupus, lupus-like disease, probable lupus, incipient lupus, you name it, whatever you want, but label the patient and treat the patient correctly. And that takes me to another even more dramatic concept. What you do with those patients who, in your heart, you think the patient has antiphospholipid syndrome, and to your surprise, lupus anticoagulant, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies, and cardiolipin antibodies persistently negative. You tested them six times, they're still negative. But you don't have any other explanation for this stillbirth of the patient, levido reticularis, or the thrombosis or the stroke she had at young age. Why well, label her as seronegative and treat her? Because if you don't do that, especially in pregnancy, we'll talk about that later in the second session, there's no chance for this lady to have baby with aspirin and heparin, which is, I'll show you, the success rate is almost 90%. I became interested in this, and obviously we are a referral center when I used to work in London, referral center for lupus and antiphospholipid syndrome, and I compared a large number of patients with 
Antiphospholipid syndrome, seropositive, classic antiphospholipid syndrome, and those who are seronegative. There is no difference whatsoever between the two groups of patients. And I published that long time ago, but the purpose of the study was much more than just comparing uh, you know, seronegative with seropositive. I wanted to go to the lab, to the genetic studies, and that will happen in the future. Obviously, I have DNA from these patients, I have sera, I have plasma from these patients, and I did so far, only the genetic study is not done yet, but I did so far the uh, uh, immunological study. And in immunological study, what I did in the study in collaboration with the laboratory in the United States, the Diagnostic Laboratory in the United States, we published recently, is to look for non-criteria antiphospholipid antibodies. Which antibodies are these? Antiphosphatidyl etanolamine antibody, antiphosphatidyl serine, antiphosphatidyl serine antibody, anti, uh, antivimentin antibody. These antibodies, you and me, we don't test routinely. And to our surprise, 35% of the patient with the seronegative antiphospholipid syndrome have these antibodies that you and me, we don't measure. And that, in the future criteria, which I mentioned before, that these will be included. And we're still discussing which new antibodies should be added to the diagnostic algorithm when you are in front of patients with antiphospholipid syndrome. And the new criteria will be, as I mentioned before, will, will come by maybe by the, by the middle of next year. And the good thing about the new criteria, for the first time after 35 years, our college, ACR and EULAR, will endorse it. So that's important advance in, in our field that our societies endorse the new criteria. Now let me move fast because I need to cover as well catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome is what the thrombotic risk in these patients. Once you identify patient because the patient have lupus, the patient have antiphospholipid antibodies, no thrombosis yet. So what's her risk to develop thrombosis? So the patient will ask you that. Well, we have data. We have data, not prospective studies. Most of these studies are retrospective or observational studies in healthy men, in unselected APL positive patients, in obstetric population, and systemic lupus erythematosus. The risk is 3 to 4 percent patient year. That means every year go by, your risk is 3 to 4 percent. Two years, 8 percent. Three years, 12 percent. Ten years, 50 percent. And there is data to support that. That tells you you need to do some form of thromboprophylaxis. With what? That will be for discussion. Is aspirin enough? I'm not sure. Should we give everybody hydroxychloroquine? Maybe. Should we give vitamin D? There's data to suggest vitamin D is protective as well. Should we avoid the oral contraceptive pill? Of course, in all ladies with antiphospholipid syndrome or antiphospholipid antibodies shouldn't take the combined pill because that will increase dramatically the, the chance of, of clotting. So all of that is important and the risk is quite high. This is not small risk. The risk also is linked to the type of antibody you have. If you have one only anticardiolipin antibody alone, the risk is lower. If you have two antibodies, for example, beta-2 glycoprotein 1 and, and anticardiolipin antibody, the risk is higher. And if you have triple positive, which is lupus anticoagulant, beta-2, and cardiolipin antibodies, the risk is huge in these patients. And these are the patients you really should be worrying about, especially when it's triple positive. What about treatment? Once you have a thrombosis, thrombotic clot, the treatment is long anticoagulation. We still dispute about the intensity of anticoagulation, how much you should anticoagulate these patients. The INR should be three to four, two to three. In venous thrombosis, two to three, it will be enough because there is two prospective study showed that this is be effective and enough. There is no need to do more intensity anticoagulation. But for arterial thrombosis, there is no convincing data that we should relax the rules about the need of anticoagulation three to four. Once you have more than one thrombosis, the recommendation is three to four in all patients, whether venous or arterial thrombosis. But the message in this slide is important. Don't stop anticoagulation because the antibody became negative. Because once you decide to anticoagulate these patients, the anticoagulation is long anticoagulation, most probably for life. Now, you will ask me this question if I don't put the slide. What about the new oral anticoagulant? 
The neural anticoagulant are not tested properly yet in antiphospholipid syndrome, and there is only two studies published. One of them is mine, the first study in the Lancet. We compared rivaroxaban versus warfarin in patients with venous thrombosis, and the follow-up was only for six months, and the number of patients was 112 patients, half of the patient warfarin, half of the patient were with rivaroxaban. For six months follow-up, there's no difference between the two. It was venous thrombosis. The second trial from Pengo was published in a couple of, uh, of weeks ago, and is published in blood. This study was interrupted prematurely because many patients with rivaroxaban has higher prob problems with thrombosis, and that drug, and, and the study has to be stopped by the data monitoring committee, but they published the data. So, the current recommendation for now, don't use these medications, especially in those patients with arterial thrombosis. I work in Dubai now, and the cardiologists frequently use these for, for arterial thrombosis. I try to stop them, but there's no, I don't have power over them, so they indicate the drug and they are following the patient. But I, the current recommendation is to not use these drugs, especially in arterial thrombosis, or triple positive. If you have you know, patient with venous thrombosis and single positive anticardiolipin antibodies, you might try it. Because our trial in, 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 in Lancet was not that bad for short-term follow-up. If you would need an update about this, as I, this is as a head of print, it's not published yet, with all what I mentioned in my, my about management is contained in this paper. It's a head of print, but it's available already by internet. Let me move with the remaining time about a condition much rare, fortunately much rare. It's uh, less than 1%, how I know that, because we have a study ongoing in Europe, collecting 1,000 patients across Europe, and from these 1,000 patients, unselected patients, only eight have catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Over my career, over you know, more than 30 years now, looking after the syndrome, I have seen maybe 100, and I have been consulted maybe by other colleagues around the world for another hundred, okay? So it's not that frequent, but once you have a case, you will always remember that case because many of these patients are dead, unfortunately, okay? Let me go through that quickly. What we are talking about, this is the one of the major differential between this syndrome and the traditional antiphospholipid syndrome is usually small vessel disease. This is Usually you have kidney problems, you have lung problems, you have brain problems affecting the small vessel, not major strokes and major, it can happen in the context of antiphospholipid syndrome, standard antiphospholipid syndrome, but typically is a small vessel disease in the skin, in the, in, in the, in the, in the kidneys, in the suprarenal glands would give you Addison disease and, and in the lungs and, and so on. So it's typically small vessel disease. This is the typical patient. You have thrombotic microangiopathy everywhere, and the patient, if you don't act very, very quickly, they die. They're in intensive care. Your colleague maybe admitted him because dermatology manifestation, admitted them for investigation while being admitted, they have deep vein thrombosis or, or heart failure or stroke or, or, or kidney failure, and they end up in intensive care and die in one week, okay? We met first time in Italy in 2003 as experts again in the field, and we decided to establish some diagnostic and therapeutic criteria for this rare condition based in very limited data. Between us, we may, we, by then we, we had 60, 70 patients, and we wanted to come up with some data for to recommend if you come across this patient in Jordan, what to do with them. Okay? And we, come, we came up with this kind of classification criteria based on eminence-based rather than evidence-based medicine. And you, for, for to classify a patient with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, as I mentioned from the beginning, is this vessel occlusion affecting three more organs or systems, develop a manifestation quickly in less than one week, histopathology of small vessel disease, which I stressed from the beginning, and confirmation of the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies. And we classify this as possible and probable and so on. And then we did go ahead and validated these criteria 
using the database that Dr. Cervera have in Barcelona. Dr. Cervera was one of our fellows in the 1990s, and when he did go back to Barcelona, he established database for this, and now he has more than 500 patients from around the world about this antiphospholipid syndrome. So you can see the sensitivity and specificity of the original criteria established then wasn't that bad, was quite good, and we lived with these criteria until now. He has in the database, as I told you, more than 500 cases now established by you through, from around the world. You go to the computer, you have the, data, the, the, the website there, and you include your case. You have case of Jordan or Chile or wherever. You include your case, and he analyzes the data every six months. You have new analysis. And the last analysis happened about, about a couple of years ago. If you want to, this is the largest analysis ever in catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. And I'll tell you some of the data quickly, so I still have five, six minutes. 69% females is to do with the link with lupus, obviously. Male, 39, 31%. Average age young, you can see, 38. 42% were primary antiphospholipid syndrome. 40% were associated with lupus, but obviously this syndrome could be associated with any other disease you can think of, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, polychondritis, ulcerative colitis, and dermatomyositis, and so on. Very rare. The majority of patients either primary antiphospholipid syndrome or lupus. The presenting manifestations, 25% cardiopulmonary as presenting manifestation, chest pain or acute respiratory failure, pulmonary embolism, cardiac failure, and myocardial infarction. CNS involvement, abdominal pain, and renal involvement were the following uh, in, in frequency. Let me go quickly on that. Cutaneous involvement, as I showed you in the, my original slides, was affected in, as first presentation in 10% of the times. Fever was common in these patients, and other less frequent manifestations, you see them in the slides. Now, if you put everything together, which organs are involved? Usually intra-abdominal, okay? More than 80% of the patients have intra-abdominal, Addison disease, infarct in the intestine, or you have liver infarction, or you have sp 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 spleen affected, infarct in the spleen, renal involvement, 72% of the cases, thrombotic microangiopathy is a very typical presentation in catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, and is also frequent in if you take the pool of 500 patients, then 72% of the time, the kidney is involved. Splenic, spleen, 17%. Gastrointestinal, perforation, 14%. Pancreatic, adrenal, Addison, is a form of presentation. You have to think of catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome in front of patients with Addison disease. Pulmonary, they end up intensive care with, uh, with uh, uh, failure, cardiac and pulmonary failure. Cerebrovascular accident, these hyperintense lesion in the brain in 60% of the time. Cardiac manifestation, 55% of the time. Cutaneous, dramatic like the case I showed you, 50% of the time. So these multi-organ disease syndrome can present in any way, and when the accumulative data is there, because by definition, you need to have more, three or more organs affected to define the syndrome, so you can see these prevalences, 60%, 40%, 70%. So it's not a surprise that many of the organs that I mentioned are affected. Sorry. Treatment. Obviously, you have a clotting problem. If you suspect that the condition, you anticoagulate the patient originally with heparin and then with warfarin if they manage to survive, but in the acute phase would be heparin. Many of these patients have lupus, as I mentioned before, and steroids are first line. Even if they don't have lupus, your intention as a rheumatologist is always to treat with steroids, which is not bad, because I don't have to, time to go into the pathogenesis of this syndrome, because there is cytokine storm in this disease. So steroids help you to reduce the cytokine storm. So it's not a bad idea to pulse them steroids in the beginning while they are in intensive care. Many of the patients receive cyclophosphamide in this series because a large number of patients have underlying lupus as well. But the saver in this disease is plasma exchange and IVIG. 
If you have access to these and you suspect the antiphospholipid syndrome, it should be immediate because this is the life saving in this condition. Obviously, other things has been done to these patients because they are intensive care and not always in your hand. And the intensivists, they have different strategies and different kind of treatments and has been, you know, as I show you in the slide, what has been used so far in, the, in this syndrome. Death, 37%, it used to be 50% when we started talking about this, which is better now when we analyze the 500 patients. It's better when we originally analyzed the first 100, was 50-50 death, okay? Now 37%, and, 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 and the death, uh, you see the SLE, primary antiphospholipid syndrome, by hemolytic anemia, thrombotic microangiopathy, and so on. 63% obviously survived, and the majority of the patients who survived, you see it in the bottom of the slides, they have anticoagulation, steroids, plasma exchange, and or IVIG. So I emphasize again, if you come across these dramatic patients, have in mind plasma exchange. If you don't have plasma exchange, think of IVIG and pulse them steroids if you can, and obviously anticoagulation. What's the chance for a patient to survive the syndrome and have a recurrent catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome? Very rare, fortunately. So those who manage to survive it, who are lucky to survive it, to have it again is very unlikely. And these patients, obviously, they are anticoagulated for life. The major trigger for this syndrome is infection, in my experience, okay? The patient is a regular patient or is not known to have antiphospholipid syndrome at all. Has chest infection or urine tract infection, end up in intensive care with catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Some patients have other reason for the catastrophe, but most patients in my experience that I have seen, maybe 60, 70, 80 patients, infection was the trigger of the majority of these patients. So the other precipitating factor, surgery. What I mean by surgery? Maybe you know about the patients and you wanted to have kidney, sir, kidney biopsy. You stopped anticoagulation in this patient and the patient during this period preparing for kidney biopsy have catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. So be careful in that. So this is my last slide to summarize it. So is acute presentation, multiple vascular occlusion less than one week by definition. Organ involvement, the most frequent one, kidney, lungs, and CNS. High teeter of antiphospholipid antibodies, usually the rule. Precipitating factor is our common. In my experiences, infection is the most trigger one. Prognosis is poor, but fortunately now we are better than before, but still poor. 37% mortality. Therapy, I put it in yellow. Plasma exchange, IVIG, should be in your mind. Some patients, they don't respond to that. You might consider rituximab, and you have a lot of money. A couple of cases were treated with ecolizumab, with this, which is complement inhibitor. It's very expensive, about $300,000 treatment so per year. So it's quite expensive. It has been used. So now, with the thrombosis society, because this is thrombotic event, storm event, we had evidence-based recommendation and guidelines. And this is what was published this year, just off, off, you know, hot of, from the news. No major change, but if we want a review about catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome, official review, this is just published recently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. I, Dr. Monder. You want to take the question now? Yeah, okay. uh, to give you some time. So okay, all right. Uh, Dr. Marwan, tfaddal. Thank you, Professor Hamashta, for this absolutely amazing talk, and welcome to Jordan. Uh, my question is, uh, do most of these patients present de novo or in the context of previously diagnosed APS? Okay, I, I mentioned that, you know, the, the majority of patients, the majority of patients reported of the 500 de novo, the majority. Some patients are classic APS, and you stopped anticoagulation for whatever reason, or obstetric APS, they were not anticoagulated, they were given aspirin or hydroxychloroquine, whatever, and they end up in catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome after infection or something triggered that. So more than half of the patient 
de novo, unfortunately. So you don't know about them in the intensive care. They don't come to you, they are in intensive care. You have to have very good relationship with intensive care unit. Do you have an easy recipe to diagnose this syndrome? Because most of the criteria, you know, waiting for a histopathology and for an APL antibody takes a week in, in, in our hospital, at least. Do you have an easy way to actually diagnose this syndrome on the spot? A suspicion, clinical suspicion. There is no other way, and clinical suspicion, antibodies, but it takes three, four days. While you are waiting, the patient might die. Clinical suspicion and skills. If you suspect, but the good thing about it, TTP treated us like this way. If you misdiagnose TTP for catastrophic antiphospholipid syndromes, treatment is the same. So treat it as TTP until you prove otherwise and call it catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Treatment is the same anyway. One, Dr. Munder. Is there a difference uh, in terms of clinical picture, prognosis, and treatment between seronegative and seropositive uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? There is no difference at all. I, I put a slide there to show you that. It's annals of rheumatic diseases about, put my name, you find it there. And compared 62 patients versus 112 patients, seropositive, seronegative. There is no difference whatsoever between the two. The only difference that they don't have the classic Anti antibodies that you and me measure on a routine basis. And this is why the new criteria will have new markers to make your life even more difficult in the future when, once you don't have the classic marker or negative and you sus still suspect the antiphospholipid syndrome, you have to do the other markers. We are being cooked while we are talking. Dr. Hala, uh, Thank you, Mundir. Uh, do you think it's time, I mean, to revise the terminology here negative antiphospholipids? And do you know, I mean, like, uh, Rheumatoid arthritis as well, so you're negative rheumatoid arthritis. Because basically there are, I mean, we know there are... Uh, the, I, mean, I put a slide. It's the so-called seronegative. Yes. It, it's, it's not seronegative. For yes. me, it's not seronegative. Yes. But to understand for a lecture, mm -hmm. I still call it seronegative because mm -hmm. it's negative for the classic criteria, yes. for laboratory criteria. For me, they are not seronegative. And I agree 100%. I, I put a slide quickly. The so-called seronegative is not seronegative at all. We don't test for it. And you know the seronegative rheumatoid arthritis? It wasn't true seronegative. Absolutely. They didn't know about CCP, and they didn't know in the 60s and yeah. 70s. But it was a useful term, because you treated them. You were there before the CCP. You were there, and you treated them. You didn't ignore the patient. But currently, I promise you, if they don't fall in hands of rheumatologists, if they fall in hands of cardiologists, if they fall in hands of obstetrician, can you imagine? If they fall in hand obstetrician, very unlikely to be treated as seronegative. Because you are used to the term seronegative lupus. You are used to the term seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. You accept the term. Neurologists have no clue whether, what you call it, seron, what is that seronegative? Where is the antibody? How, how a neurologist will explain to his patient that you have antiphospholipid syndrome, but you don't have the marker. Don't expect the neurologist to know that. You, you are expert in explaining that to your patient with rheumatoid arthritis without rheumatoid factor. You are used to it. You have 50 years of experience with it. Not the neurologist. If they don't see the antibody, they diagnose the patient. Zero. Okay, last question, Dr. Badia. So it's a useful term. My point is a useful term for now. Okay? Thank you, Mundar. I just want to ask you, how frequent you see them, those what so-called seronegative? What's are, the question, sorry? Are they frequent? The frequency. What's the percentage, Yanni? Yani, the, the, the 35% in my, in my patients that I tested in the United States, they have other antibodies. I see. The that. most frequent one, the most frequent one, antiphosphatyl serine prothrombin antibody, the most frequent one, and is very likely to be part of the new criteria. Very likely. We are discussing that currently. Very likely the new criteria, once you test for beta-2 glycopotin-1 cardiolipin antibody lupus anticoagulant, they are negative. Second round of test, you do this test when it becomes available in Jordan, obviously, in the future. How it's available now commercially. How, how the percentage of those, what so-called seronegative as for... The, the seropositive, how many of ah. them have this antibody? 60-70% of the patient. Oh. No, the percentage of those patients that you call them so zero negative yes if you have 100 patient negative and positive how percentage those zero negative if if, you, if the chairman point? allow me uh, because i did go the slide quickly i'll show you i am passionate about zero negative antiphospholipid syndrome you know that i'll fight for it 
It's an important question. Here is the percentages. Here, okay? Okay. IgA cardiolipin antibody doesn't help you. Beta 2 glycoprotein 1, 1.5 percent. Phosphatidylserine prothrombin IgG 7.4 percent. Phosphatidylserine prothrombin IgM 13.2 percent. Phosphatidylethanolamine IgG 22 percent. Phosphatidylethanolamine, you see? I see. But okay. still, the question is, uh, is how how frequent you see those? Seronegative. What do you call them seronegative? Less than, less, seronegative. Le less than one percent of the APS patients. I see. That's the, the answer. Less than one percent. So it's rare, rare. but but undiagnosed. This could be the next patient, your neighbor, your wife, your daughter, or your best friend. Given this is the mind. problem. This is the problem. Okay? They're rare. I didn't say they are frequent. They are frequent. And let me let's take advantage of your courtesy and I'll show that. Therefore. In daily clinical practice, it's not unusual. It's not frequent. We say this is editorial by me and Graham Hughes 15 years back. It's a half page editorial published in December. I remember that. It took us six months to write this. Because if you are a lazy doctor, any patient with thrombosis could be labeled seronegative APS. I'm not saying that. We want you to focus on those who have thrombosis, stroke, heart attacks, with levido reticularis, thrombocytopenia, no other reason for their stroke and heart attacks. And thrombocytopenia. These are the patients who should be tested further. Okay. Uh, no time so, for further questions. We will move to the next session. Sorry for that. Okay. Uh, but it's an important about, question. So. Yeah. We will talk now about antiphospholipid syndrome and pregnancy. Again, Dr. Munder. We can come to more questions if you want, if we have time after that second one, if it's okay with you, okay? Another passion of mine is pregnancy because from the beginning, when I joined Graham Hughes in 1986, he was, you know, the, uh, Professor Hughes is a very good clinician, an astute clinician. He knew that the impact of antiphospholipid syndrome is going to be pregnancy, and no doubt about that. He's right. You know, the obstetric department are full of it. All, any obstetric department in Jordan should be full of it. Any recurrent miscarriage clinic should be full of it. So the, he knew the impact of this was huge, and I was lucky to select me to be involved in the pregnancy clinic from the beginning. I have been running clin a pregnancy clinic since 1988, I think, okay? So I have a special passion about this topic, and I'm going to share with you uh, some data about how we manage this very, very... A grateful syndrome, because if you diagnose the patient with this condition, the next pregnancy, she responds very well. The response is very good to treatment, okay? Pregnancy is a major manifestation of this, and what we're talking about pregnancy, miscarriages, okay? One in five ladies sitting here in the audience, when they fall pregnant, between 20 and 30 years old, will end up in miscarriage. So to have early miscarriage is common, okay? To have recurrent miscarriage is only about 3-4% of the ladies sitting here, to have three or more miscarriages. And of these miscarriages, a small percentage have antiphospholipid antibodies. The typical thing of antiphospholipid syndrome is not early miscarriage. When a lady passed the 12 weeks of pregnancy, and by 20-22 weeks she had stillbirth or fetal loss, this is typical of antiphospholipid syndrome. So you don't have to wait for three, four miscarriages to occur. Once you have fetal death, test immediately. This is patient is suspicious. How, how I know that? There's some epidemiological data. Pregnancy, fortunately, is nine months, and obstetric departments all around the world became interested in this syndrome because the impact treatment has in the outcome. So we have data. We don't have data in the antiphospholipid syndrome thrombotic side. Here, we have a lot of data. So we have very scientific data to support what I'm saying. So for three consecutive early miscarriage, 10% of these patients will have antiphospholipid antibodies and therefore, by definition, antiphospholipid syndrome. If you have 
Take patient with second or third trimester, i.e. 22, 25 week loss, which is fetal loss, it's not miscarriage anymore, about 20% will have antiphospholipid syndrome. If you have a patient with late pregnancy loss, which British call stillbirth, when the patient baby die at 35 weeks, and the baby is small for gestational age or intrauterine growth restriction, 30% have antiphospholipid syndrome. You're not going to save these, but if you diagnose them, next pregnancy, success rate more than 85%. This is a party we do with these ladies every year, and the reason for the party is not other than awareness, because this is kind of party, bring the media. The, who f is photographing is not the husbands, I promise you that. Who is photographing there is the media. For us, it's very important, because all my research in London dependent on money generated through charities and through donations. And it was important for my research program to have this kind of, of uh, awareness week every, every year, okay? Coming back to that, how we define or classify antiphospholipid syndrome, as I mentioned, three or more early miscarriages before 10 weeks, any fetal loss, or any late pregnancy complications such as severe preeclampsia or intrauterine growth restriction. These are the classification criteria for antiphospholipid syndrome or obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome. And as you know, you need the, the test, cardiolipin antibody, lupus anticoagulant, or anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1, two times apart, 12 weeks apart, to classify the patient as antiphospholipid syndrome. Now, what's the evidence that these antibodies are pathogenic, okay? The best thing we have is animal models, which is, has been useful to test the drugs that we currently use for antiphospholipid syndrome. This in, 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 um, in animals, in, in, in rats, this is equivalent to miscarriages. You see the empty sac there? This is the, the full sac. The third one is the full sac. This is fetuses, okay? The, f the second one is empty sac, equivalent in human to miscarriages. And it was very useful to have this animal model to test different drugs. And that helped us to come up with the conclusion that aspirin and heparin and maybe other drugs, which we'll discuss later, are useful in the antiphospholipid syndrome. Then we have epidemiological studies. You know, obstetric department, as I told you, became interested in this syndrome from the beginning. In the 80s now, we had colleagues with us involved, they are obstetric colleagues involved in this syndrome and become as a major criteria of this syndrome. And most epidemiological data suggest the antibody is linked to miscarriages, especially late miscarriages and intrauterine growth restriction and preeclampsia. And the other evidence as well, we were able to elute the antibody from the placenta. From the placenta of these patients, we were able to elute the antibody. Now, one of my problems, the assumption that these antibodies cause problem in the baby through clotting. It was easy to assume, assume, never assume in medicine, but we assumed for a while, if you don't have circulation to the baby, the baby die, and you have clotting problem in the placenta, and the baby die, and that's it. This is the mechanism how this happened. The truth is not that. I spent five years of my life collecting placentas from these patients, and you are, have big surprise. There is no correlation what you find in the placenta and the outcome, i.e., you could find a placenta with huge thrombosis like this one in the slide, and the baby was delivered at 39 weeks without any problem, and vice versa. You have normal placenta, and the baby have intrauterine growth, the mother have intrauterine growth restriction or have stillbirth at 32 weeks, okay? So there's no correlation between what you find in the placenta and the outcome. That tells you maybe the problem is not clotting alone. There's other problems. We're still not 100% sure what it is. Definitely aspirin and heparin help, but maybe they are helping not only as anti-clotting, maybe they are helping because they have anti-inflammatory effect or maybe interfere, interfere with, with, uh, with other markers, call it complement, call it whatever you want, that this is where the help come, not by their effect as anticoagulant. We still don't know. What's the mechanism causing these pregnancy losses and late pregnancy losses and, uh, and, and placental insufficiency? We still don't know. I don't have time to go th one through one by one, but the red is because it's the most recent 
theory, although it's not proven theory in human or in animal models so far, some data from human is, uh, is available to suggest maybe complement activation is part of it. Sorry. You okay? Fear? Okay. Maybe complement activation is part of the syndrome, and maybe the treatment in the future have to shift slightly, not only with aspirin and heparin. Maybe we have to take care of this complement activation and consider again steroids and so on. I'll come back to that in a minute. When it comes to treatment, it's not me alone. It's vital you, you collaborate. As I don't expect you to have collaborative clinic like I do because I have referral center, then we have many patients to justify that me and the obstetrician sit in the same room, okay? I don't expect you to do that. I don't think you have the pool of patients to afford to do that. In London, so popular clinic, we had two clinics a week, okay? We had two clinics a week, and between us, we used to see in London at least 70 to 80 patients every week, okay? With the obstetrician sitting together. All right, so it was an important clinic, which I, I put you the slides, the old slide when I was young and beautiful. Then this, we have hematologist, obstetrician, my side in the left, obstetric physician, and neonatologist. They are very expensive clinics. I don't expect you to do that, but it would be nice to collaborate, to understand, to talk with colleagues. They don't understand very much the use of uh, steroids and uh, for lupus and uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, or let's not call it anti-TNF, because now some of the anti-TNF anti can be used in pregnancy, and you expect the obstetrician to panic with that, okay? So it's, it's, the collaboration is important to talk, to, uh, to, 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 to plan the pregnancy if possible before the patient fall pregnant with your obstetrician. This is what I expect you to do. We have referral center, and the first thing I did in Dubai when I arrived in, 19, uh, in 2005, 15, sorry, is to establish pregnancy clinic. Six weeks later, I had pregnancy clinic, and today, every week, we see about 10 to 12 patients every week. We become, you know, referral, well-known, and we are glad to do combined clinic in Dubai. Okay, so the, the important of the outcome is really timely delivery. I'm not going to dwell on that, lecturing you on that, but time, timely delivery is very important because many of these patients will have late pregnancy complications despite treatment. I'll come to that. Despite treatment, they still have late pregnancy complications like, you know, a premature delivery, intrauterine growth restriction, you name it, okay? Severe preeclampsia. And you know that to, to determine when to deliver the baby is not your task, really, the task of the obstetrician with your support. And timely, timely delivery is vital in these patients. This is what the scan look like, normal scan, the, the, the uterine artery Doppler scan, cystool, diastool, cystool, diastool is normal, and then you see the notch in the middle. And if you see that notch in the middle, around 20, 22 weeks, that's bad news, but not 100%, okay? And that shows you in a minute in, in a slide how we use that uh, in, in, in clinical practice. This is the umbilical artery. We do uterine artery, around 20, 22 weeks, and after that, umbilical artery. Normal scan, you see that, reduced, you see the flow in the end of the stool, uh, reduced. Absence, there is space there, and sometimes the resistance is so high, even you have revert. And once you, you see the third and fourth pattern, you have to act quickly, because that patient, if you don't act and deliver, the, the baby will die, okay? So this is where the collaboration with the obstetrician it's vital, it's their role and their tools. It's not your tool, it's their tool, but you have to collaborate with them. They will decide when to deliver the baby. Coming back to the uterine artery Doppler scan, is very valuable for you to reassure the patient. The negative predictive value is very good for you to reassure the patient. What's the meaning of that? Like D-dimer, okay? If you do accident and emergency, patient come to accident and emergency and you suspect deep vein thrombosis. You do D-dimer. If it's positive, could be anything, okay? If it's negative, you kick the patient home. You don't have deep vein thrombosis, is that correct? Here's the same. So you have uterine artery Doppler scan normal, you reassure the patient. The chance for your next pregnancy, remember these, pregnancy, these patients have problems in the past. The chance for your pregnancy to succeed is very good. 
So the negative predictive value is very good to reassure the patient. If the Doppler scan is positive, well, it can go wrong in 60% of the time, okay? So how we treat these patients, okay? And, and you see the treatment of choice or the standard of care today is aspirin and heparin, which is low molecular weight heparin. Now, high dose prednisolone has been used very successfully. When I joined the clinic in 1986, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 1992, treatment of choice, 40 milligram steroids, 40, 50 milligram steroids, success rate, I promise you, 70%. So you say, why you abandon steroids? We abandon steroids because small study from the United States by the obstetrician showed if you give aspirin plus steroids compared to heparin plus aspirin, success rate 70%. Side effects in the mother and baby is a huge side effect. So we abandoned, abandoned steroids, not because of lack of efficacy. We abandoned steroids because of side effects. I am not going to go through this slide in detail because I publish a lot in this field. And if you put my name, you'll find publication, two, three publications every year about this. But, you know, different situations require different treatment, but all of it is combination between aspirin and heparin. I only could focus on the red one where I say for recurrent early miscarriage, if a patient only have three early miscarriage and nothing else, Although the current recommendation recommend aspirin and heparin, and very likely that your obstetrician will give aspirin and low molecular weight heparin, in my experience and other people's experience, you might get away with it with aspirin alone, okay? Aspirin alone could be enough with early recurrent miscarriages. But if you have late pregnancy loss or severe preeclampsia and so on, always aspirin and heparin, which is, when I say heparin, usually low molecular weight heparin. Okay. Now let's go to the scenario where the patient didn't respond, i.e. you have aspirin and heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and she come to your clinic and didn't work. So what do you do next? And here you have a problem because you tell the patient, try again. And the patient will tell you, no, doctor, I tried aspirin and heparin and it didn't work. Give me something else. The patient wants to feel that in the next pregnancy she's taking something else. And what's going to be this something else? For me, steroids. Why? Because I told you, we abandoned steroids not because they were not effective. We abandoned steroids because of side effects. So what I did in London with my colleagues, we cheated. So we gave aspirin, heparin, and steroids, but not 40 milligrams, 10. 10 milligrams until you reach the first trimester. And once you reach the first trimester, you wean them down by 20 weeks, steroids stopped altogether, success rate was 62%, and we published that in a very important journal in blood. So we cheat. We give steroids in this subgroup of patients. If you are in America, they give IVIG. I don't know why to do with insurance, despite that four trials showed adding IVIG to aspirin and heparin is not superior to aspirin and heparin. Despite there's four trials, all failed, okay? They still give IVIG. Anecdotal data suggest might be effective as well. Hydroxychloroquine now is favored to be added as well, not only in lupus patient, in patient with obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome, and there is data to support that, and I have personal data which I published there with my colleagues a couple of years back. Plasma exchange for severe cases, I'm not talking about obstetric APS, I'm talking patient with severe stroke, severe heart attack, severe deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, they still come to your clinic, they want to fall pregnant, and some of them could be treated, and we, I published that uh, just recently, with plasma exchange with my Italian uh, colleagues. And you'll see, and surprised to see statins there. You know how many people take, took statins around the world? 800,000 800, people took statins around the world during pregnancy, despite this labeled X. I don't know if you are aware, but this FDA classification of drugs in pregnancy is crap. It doesn't exist anymore. There are statements about the drugs. X was statins. So why, why it, it, about, uh, about one million people treated, treated with, with, with statins in pregnancy? Because the obstetrician, they believe, they couldn't prove that statins is a good drug to prevent preeclampsia. So a lot of trials around the world with statins in pregnancy, they couldn't prove prevent preeclampsia, 
but you know, his exposure to statins is not X, don't use in pregnancy, don't worry about that. How much we have experience in antiphospholipid syndrome? Very little, but it has been used and it could be. I have one experience personally in Dubai with one patient which was successful, you can try. Now this is important. This is important when I lecture, especially not to you, when I lecture obstetrician. Because they think obstetrician, their job finished with the baby. Okay, I helped you, you have baby, I have my gift, everybody's happy, no. If you don't refer the patient to the rheumatologist or internist, you didn't make that patient big help because this patient have risk to stroke or to have heart attack or deep vein thrombosis if she don't follow thromboprophylaxis. Can we quantify this risk? Yes. As we mentioned before, four or five percent patient here. This is a huge risk, a huge risk. This is about 50 times more than the general population. Do we have data? We have French data, and we have Spanish data as well to support that. This study from France followed obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome patient in green for 15 years. And after 15 years, about 25% have thrombosis. Compared to the general population, and compared to congenital thrombophilia, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, and all of that. So if you have obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome, you need some sort of thromboprophylaxis after delivery. And these patients, they come, don't come to you. They have only obstetric antiphospholipid syndrome. Usually they don't come to you. So my message to them, please refer the patient to us. Now, as I mentioned before in a previous slide, the higher the risk, it will be with a triple positive. Those are the higher risk for thrombosis and those also the higher risk for pregnancy complications as well. Now, let me tell you about the project. As I told you, we have 1,000 patients across Europe with antiphospholipid syndrome and what the experience with pregnancy. It's an interesting experience, okay? 35% of these patients have obstetric complications. So what happened to these 1,000 patients over the years? 10 years of follow-up. So what happened to these patients? Thrombosis, perfect. You know, 39% did go to 4%. Stroke, 31%, 9%. Pulmonary embolism, 14%, 4%. Myocardial infarction, 6%, 2%. We're doing very well with warfarin, you name it, okay? We're doing very well. What happened with obstetrics? Here is the worry, absolute worry. Okay, it's an important message here, okay? Preeclampsia didn't change, okay? Early pregnancy loss, we reduced dramatically. Late pregnancy loss, we reduced dramatically, okay? Life birth with prematurity, we triplicate. Life birth with intrauterine growth restriction, we multiplied by until 26%. What's the interpretation of that? Our drugs are good, but not good enough. Now these babies used to die before, now they live thanks to aspirin and heparin, but they are developed prematurely. And the last thing you wanted is this. The last thing you wanted to deliver a baby at 24 weeks. The last thing you wanted, okay? This is the, the, this very, will be obviously abnormal babies. It's very hard for the mother, for the society, for you, for me, for anybody to have premature baby at 25, 25, 26, 27 weeks. And this is the nightmare that we see more and more now with good treatment, but it's not good enough. We have to improve more of treatment, okay? Now let me go to, with the last few minutes, to another field, very, commercial field, unfortunately. I don't know if there is obstetrician in the audience, but it's very commercial, okay? And there is no evidence-based medicine here. Very little evidence-based medicine because they are, these infertility doctors are busy making money, okay? While we are here learning on Friday, they are making money in their private clinics, and it's true. In London, the same. It's not only in Jordan, okay? In London, the same. They are making a lot of money, tons of it, okay? Now, people working in the field, they thought maybe has an implication for antiphospholipid syndrome in infertility. There is any data to support that. It's very controversial. This is the most controversial topic in obstetric medicine, okay? Where is the evidence that we should do these antibodies for any lady going for infertility treatment or IVF? They do it, but there's no evidence, okay? No evidence whatsoever. So the college, the American College of Reproductive Medicine, became very concerned about this. Where is the evidence that you should do these multiple tests for these ladies before you do IVF? So they asked somebody, 
to do systematic review. Let's review the literature, find out what's the chance of pregnancy with, with, uh, with IVF, and what's the chance of taking baby home with IVF by testing antiphospholipid antibodies. There's no difference. Do you see the value average? No difference whether you have likelihood of successful IVF and the likelihood of taking baby home. There's no difference at all. So they concluded, the college, not me, nothing to do with me, the college, they concluded routine testing for antiphospholipid antibodies is not indicated in IVF. Based on existing data, therapy not justified. They didn't give a damn, okay? Still being done, the same. And this is the college, not me, college, their college. They're still being tested. Many antibodies tested. We don't believe this data. This is old data. And the college did the study again. They, the college, they did the study again, and the conclusion is still the same. This is again by the American College of Reproductive Medicine. Antiphospholipid antibodies do not affect IVF success. And believe it or not, your colleagues in the hospital here in Jordan, they're still doing multiple testing for these ladies when they go for IVF. And there is no evidence for that. These are the recommendation based on the EULAR. I am a member of the EULAR and, and the recommendation, everything I said about IVF, everything I said about pregnancy is contained in this document. Thank you very much. Dr. Badia. Thank you, Munder, for this update. I just want to ask you about the infertility in men with antiphospholipid syndrome. No, 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 no much data there, and very little data, and a good question. Very little data available about infertility in men and antiphospholipid syndrome. Because I have a patient. The only, the only, the only data available in mice, in mice, and there is link to infertility. But in men, it's a good question. I have to look into that. Very little data. You have a man with antiphospholipid antibodies infertility. Yes. And also there is uh, uh, obstruction of the artery intra. That, that, that's the, 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 the justification in the testicles. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That could be the way to explain infertility in these patients. Anecdotes has been reported, but there is no data studies about infertility, to best of my knowledge. Cases, yes, I am aware of that. I am aware of that. Uh, yeah. Dr. Behind you, yeah. Thank you, the Professor Khamashita. What's the risk of developing osteoporosis during treatment uh, with heparin during pregnancy, uh, uh, please? Okay, that's a good question. Is um, the treatment with heparin, you mean? Because you are worried about yeah, heparin. Yeah, yeah. Long look with heparin. There is more publication than patients, okay? There is more publication, I swear, there is more publication about possible osteoporosis from low molecular weight heparin than patients. In my experience, and we published that, by the way, I have three. I came across them with fracture, okay? Now, without fracture, to have osteoporosis, no doubt about that, low molecular weight heparin, less risky than regular heparin, but we're talking about one year of treatment. Now, if I extend the question and go beyond pregnancy, I have about 50 patients, I have we are a big referral center, they take heparin long time for not pregnancy. They take it because they couldn't take warfarin or they couldn't take anti oral anticoagulant for other reasons. And I have my record that one patient took it for 17 or 18 years. She has osteoporosis anyway, and she is 60 something. She has osteoporosis anyway, but as a causation of osteoporosis, low molecular weight heparin is less risk. The fracture is, in my experience, very rare. Uh, I want to ask uh, if you had uh, a patient with antiphospholipid syndrome came to you with thrombocytopenia around 20,000. Okay. How do you manage here? Okay, this is very common, very, very common. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we were dwelling whether thrombocytopenia should be included as part of the syndrome. 30 per, in my experience, 30% of patients with antiphospholipid syndrome have thrombocytopenia, 30%. And I have seen thousands of patients, without exaggeration, okay, thousands, okay? Extremely rarely they bleed, extremely rarely, underline that. 20,000, you panic, but they, 
the, you panic the patient because you say, you ring the patient, your, your blood tests in the culture show 20,000, come to my clinic immediately. You panic, you panic the patients, but the, the truth is very, very, very rarely they bleed. Now how you manage? My limit, my limit is 50,000. Above 50,000, I don't change anything, okay? If they take warfarin, carry on taking warfarin, don't worry about it, okay? Below 50,000, I think you should stop warfarin for a while, okay? And you, you use heparin if you want, but you stop warfarin. The first line of treatment is steroids. Steroids in the antiphospholipid syndrome, it works as well, or low platelets, okay? If it doesn't work, the, the new, uh, there is new uh, um, stimulator of, of, of platelets that hematologists use. I don't think you have privilege as a rheumatologist to use them because they are expensive. El trombo back, el trombo back. It works. The data in antiphospholipid syndrome, it works. In extreme cases, if these patients don't respond to steroids and el trombo back and these medications, you have splenectomy. You can go to splenectomy and it works. And it's not contraindicated in antiphospholipid syndrome. The majority of patients respond. And you're not going to believe some patients respond even to aspirin. You say, how you give aspirin to patients with antiphospholipid syndrome with low platelets? It works. And as you know, the media call this syndrome sticky blood. Many of the patients have no real thrombocytopenia. They have pseudo thrombocytopenia. The culture counter count thousands of cells, thousands of platelets as one, okay? So you have to ask your hematologist to do it under the microscope the traditional way, manual, manual. So many are pseudo thrombocytopenia, not real. Th 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 so, uh, but occasionally you come difficult cases and you need to try the drugs has been used. The, uh, hydroxychloroquine could be helpful as well if, the, if she's not taking hydroxychloroquine. Rotoximab. Rotoximab in severe cases could be used, of course. Of course, hematologists, the first line of treatment for them will be rotoximab. Okay. During pregnancy, no. During pregnancy, you have to, to just uh, don't panic. Give IVIG, pregnancy IVIG, not rituximab. Okay. Rituximab goes to the baby, okay? Okay, thank you, Dr. Bonder, for this comprehensive talk. Thank, thank you, you again. We will move to the final speaker.